Okay, a quick mention before the bid starts. I just want to apologise quickly about the gap again in between videos. Um, it was technical based this time. Thankfully, a cash injection and some tech support from the mate. And once again, I am fully operational. So, with the explanations out of the way, here's a very special episode of Spider Law TV. One for all you mums out there. So I'm releasing this on Mother's Day, at least in the UK, because today I am talking about a spider that is the ultimate mother. After all, you do anything for your kids, right? Go without luxuries, go without a meal, go without sleep, kill for them, die for them. Amarobius goes one step further. Commonly known as the lace weaver, we have a three Amarobius species in the UK out of the 67 that exist worldwide. Amarobius ferox, the black lace weaver. Now this is the biggest of the three, and as you would expect, the darkest. Although the actual shade can vary greatly depending on the age and the sex of the spider. Also the least common, particularly in the north. Amarobius fenestralis, the window lace weaver. Fenestralis actually comes from the Latin for window. These spiders are usually found in rural habitats like woods and undergrowth and they're actually found around windows a lot less than our main subject today which is Amarobius similis, the common lace weaver. It was named similis due to its similarity to Fenestralis which was discovered first. Indeed, they can only be distinguished through microscopic examination of the genitalia. Often mistaken for Steatoda nobilis due to very surface similarities, they aren't actually all that alike at all as this photo will show, but some people mistake them for uh, Steatoda nobilis and unfortunately a great many have been killed due to this. Not that you should be killing Steatoda nobilis either. Amorobus similis, your best bet if you want to see it, is at night time when they're very active you will usually find them on cracked old walls around their vertical fluffy lace-like web which is obviously where the spider gets its name. Now although I will be in the main discussing Amorobius similis today as it is by far the most common of the three the behaviours that I will be talking about do apply to all of the Amorobius and where to begin for truly this particular spider has some fascinating behaviours. So Amorobius belongs to a type of spider called criblet spiders which means that they retain an organ that has evolved out of most species the cribellum. It's a small plate just below the spinnerets that produces extra extra fine silk and the silk is not inherently doesn't have glue added to it like thread silk does on orb webs. Cribbillet silk is adhesive but it's not chemical it's a mechanical stickiness due to its property its structure. I'll be doing another video about different types of silk so I'll leave it there for now I don't want to get too technical suffice to say that cribbillet silk is is very fine the spider then fluffs this up even further using comb-like hairs on its back legs, making it really fluffy, almost like cotton wool. And this results in the lace webs from where the spider gets its name. This web has a bluish tint when new, fading to grey as the web gets older. Now, unlike other spiders, Amorobius just adds fresh silk on top of its old webs. Um, it doesn't eat them and recycle it like many orb weavers do. Now, Amorobius can actually spin normal thread silk as well, as you'll see in this picture where I have a juvenile specimen on my hand. You can see that it's attached a safety line between my thumb and my hand, uh, just in case it should fall while clambering. It will just hang on that line, work its way back up. So these lacy webs are, are very good at capturing prey, but they don't use an adhesive they don't use a glue instead they just kind of cling to things it's a bit like that fake cotton wool web that you can get at halloween full of lots of little fibers um, this is the same kind of web that a net casting spider from australia would use as well so that's the web already pretty interesting right but now we get to the crazy bit now we get to mother's day courtship wise for these spiders things are pretty standard 
The male will approach the female's web, strum a thread for a little bit to indicate his presence and intentions. After all, he does not want to get mistaken for food. Then she will hopefully let him approach and mate with her. This normally takes place in the late summer to autumn months. The female lives for about two years, whereas the male lives for under half of that, dying shortly after they reach maturity, so it doesn't make a great deal of difference should she eat him after the mating process, and it would be a good first meal to nourish her developing eggs. Speaking of which, spring next year, she's going to lay her egg sac, which she will then not leave. When the spiderlings are ready to hatch, she will tear a hole in the egg sac so that the spiderlings, which can number up to 150, can emerge in a tight cluster. Again, so far, perfectly standard, but this is where things will change. Most spiders have the ability to lay multiple clutches of eggs. Indeed, one steatode and abilis that I studied in captivity laid around about 15 egg sacs, all of which hatched. That's a lot of baby spiders. Amorobius will forgo this for a process called trophic eggs, a behaviour that is designed to mitigate cannibalism in the offspring and give as many of her children as possible a chance for survival. Firstly, a few days after the spiderlings hatch, she will start laying silk on and around her young and drumming her palps. This will promote activity in the young and then they will clamber onto and under her, under her abdomen. She will then sacrifice the future clutches that she might have laid by producing trophic eggs, which are unfertilized and designed for nutrition and not development. The young will feed on these and grow rapidly. After consuming the eggs, they will move away from the mother, although not far away, just not on her, and they will molt a few days later. Then Amorobius will make the ultimate sacrifice. Anywhere up to a week after the trophic feeding and the spiderling's subsequent molt, she will once again start signalling her young, spinning around and once again drumming her palps in a time-to-eat beat. But this time, things are about to turn murderous. The spiderlings will clamber all over her and start biting her, and as spiders do, start consuming the fluid from her body. Mercifully, it will not take all that long until that amount of bites will overcome her and she will die. But make no mistake, she is alive when they start feeding. They are eating her alive. This process is called matrophagy, the eating of the maternal, the mother. She could fight them off. She is more than big enough to do so. She could escape, but she will not. This is the ultimate mother's sacrifice. The feeding will take a couple of hours at most. After the matrophagy is over, the young will be extremely swollen and will have no need to prey upon each other. Though not all will survive to adulthood, the female has given them their very best chance for survival, the ultimate sacrifice that a mother can make for her young. I hope you found this episode of Spider Lord TV interesting and informative. I'll be back soon with another episode, so please feel free to share this, give it a like, maybe drop me a subscription, and remember, chill out. It's just a spider.